the very thing I hoped she wouldn't say. Mm. Um, and, and she'd left it just fractionally too late. She was a bit older than she should have been um, for a second lover and was, had been very beautiful, as all the pictures in my book will show, and was, I think, in terrible dread of losing her looks and becoming old. And, and it didn't really work out. And so I, I, she seems to have decided, from what I can reconstruct, that she didn't want to go on living anymore. She wouldn't get another chance. And, um, and the boyfriend was a bit unstable, I think probably a bit bipolar. And I have a feeling he talked her into it. But at any rate, they made a suicide pact. They flew to Athens and, and made an end of themselves. Mm. It's... Um, it was, I read about it in the newspapers as a murder. I, when I went to see my mother's body, what I went to see was a crime scene. Um, but I found out by investigation that it wasn't, he hadn't killed her. They, they, they'd made an agreement to die together. And very, very tough for my father. You said you found that she had put a number of phone calls to you that mm. night before it happened. Over the course of the day she was there, Yes, she, she, the switchboard at the hotel showed several attempted calls. It was hard to do international calling in those days. So there was a record of, they, can you place this call? And it was to my number. And I was a young person then living in London, hadn't been there long, wasn't at home a lot, wasn't there. And I've always thought that if I picked up the phone, that, yes, yeah, she, she would have had a handhold of some kind. Um, yeah, you and said... that maybe that's why she was calling. I mean, I just don't know, which is no. what makes it. But again, not to seem mawkish, but the, f the thought I had all the time in my head was, how am I going to tell my father this? He's such a private guy. He's so uh, reticent. He's so committed to the decencies. He knows that his wife is living half the time with another guy, but none of their friends know. They're, they're kept up appearances. Now everyone's going to find out everything about him and through the newspapers. Did you find it hard to write about? Yeah, I certainly did. You have many admirers, but many enemies also. Um, did you worry that writing about uh, yourself at great length, honestly, it seems, you know, um, would open a flank to those who would take you down? Do well, you feel vulnerable? Well, I think that every time I, I put pen to paper or write an article at all, it's a field day possibly for those who don't like me. Um, you're, you're always putting yourself out there. Any time you write a book, you're doing that, even if it's not about yourself. People who don't like you can find a way. So that's all right. And I have quite a thick skin and quite a broad back. And also, I, I quite often make criticisms of other people. Yes, so yes you do. I would both, if I, didn't, if I didn't look a fool, if I complained about being attacked, I'd certainly feel a fool. But you didn't have to write a memoir. What made you want to do it now? The book is quite a lot about a group of friends of which I've been part for a long time. And it's not just about me, it's a memoir. It's not an autobiography, it's a memoir. And a memoir is about the people who were important to you in the moments that were. And some of the friends I've had, I think, are interesting to other people too. It seems to me you were very um, well served by your, <coughs> by your times, um, in that mm. when you went to Oxford, Yes, you met James Fenton, the yes. poet who became, you said, I mean, you virtually dated year zero, I mean, the clock zeroed, and then everything was uh, measured after that. Um, but you also were at a time that people like John Berger and, and Isaiah Berlin and Noam Chomsky mm -hmm. were there. Um, and then you went to Fleet Street. It was a bit of a Bloomsbury period, wasn't it? And you ran into Ian McEwan, um, uh, Martin Amos. Yes. Um, you had lunch together, you drank together, you yeah. ran around together, you dated women together. You were lucky, weren't you, in your time? Very lucky. And uh, it's become, in a way that makes me a bit uneasy, the sort of stuff of legend now, the, the Friday lunch, it was actually in Bloomsbury. That was pure accident. I mean, we weren't trying to emulate. You can't have a set if you set out to have one. Mm. Mm. Or a push. Mm -hmm. um, you can't, but it sort of occurred. Yes conspicuously absent on a regular basis were any women. In fact, frankly, Christopher, conspicuously absent through your whole book um, is, a, is a powerful presence of women. Why is that? Did you, did you guys not think it was normal well, that well, you only ever met you men? I'll tell you what I decided at the beginning, and I put a cautionary note at the front. Um, I only have copyright in myself, and uh, if I write about other people, it's because either they're, they're already public figures or they've written about me or 
it's in some way a fair game, or if they're dead. And to write about the influence of women, uh, which I do twice, by the way, in case, I mean, when I write about my mother, I'm saying how I learned about the importance of the female principle and learned about it in a very nice way. And the way my mother explained to me things about love and sex in an unbelievably powerful but, but subtle way should give you a clue. And then I say when I talk about my great love, Martin Amos, that all our discussions were entirely about... That doesn't the, really count. Yes, but I'm not going to say who we were talking about. That would, that, you would you'd be criticising me now for the opposite reason if I'd done that. Hitch 22. Yes, ma'am. Um, great time. <laughs> Great title. There was, of course, a catch-22, which roughly, I think, meant it was something like if you were... Uh, the only way you'd get out of the war is if you pleaded insanity, but if you advanced that argument, then you, you clearly had to be weren't insane. insane. Yeah. Is there a hitch-22? Yes. A, yeah. What is the hitch-22? Um, the hitch-22 for me is that having been involved in various kinds of quite solid commitment and allegiance throughout a lot of my life, and been through it and out the other side, that now the only group I'm associated with is a loosely knit collection of people. Richard Dawkins is the best known member of them. The founding group meeting of this group was held in my house. There's a photograph of it in the book. Sam Harris, Dan Dennett, people who are, want to defend science and reason and who say that the, the main principles are that the only thing you're sure of is uncertainty. Mm. that the only thing that uh, is certain is doubt, uh, that the main thing is the Socratic principle, that you have to, you're only educated when you understand how ignorant you are. And so all, all assertions of faith or absolutism or complete belief are almost by definition useless and false. And that actually that's quite a strong commitment to be making. To, and you to, called... a, to a party of doubt and uncertainty, open-mindedness and scepticism. And I feel I can spend the rest of my life doing that with a fair degree of conviction. And you coined that so idea as Hitch-22. Uh, Hitch-22. It's so interesting to hear you talk about doubt and scepticism. Rather skepticism. conceitedly, perhaps, but I needed a title as well. I mean. um, because I would... It's also from, if I can just mention it, because we haven't talked about Salman yet, and I... No. And in case we don't, um, one of the word games that we boys used to play... Yes. One of the printable ones was, and invented by him, was uh, book titles that didn't quite make it. I list them in the book. Um, uh, For Whom the Bell Rings. Um, the Big Gatsby. Uh, uh, Mr. Zhivago. Um, Good Expectations. All that, all that kind of thing. And we went through a lot of these. My uh, Portrait of a Woman was one of mine. Um, uh, Two days in the life of Ivan Denisovich. Uh, anyway, <laughs> this was you, you were doing of, at the lunch club. One of them was Hitch Twenty Two, uh, and I remember thinking I might need that one day. <laughs> but as with a lot of things, Salman is the is the man who comes up with the brilliant encapsulation. People don't realise how witty he is. They think of him as a rather solemn guy on the run, always glaring into the camera as if he's half a refugee, always in trouble. You know, and he's mighty. And it's all true. He's an extremely serious person and a very serious novelist, but. He's probably the, the, the wittiest user of the English language alive. And it's only his second language. You moved to America permanently. Yes. In the early 80s. That's a huge step. Well, I used to... I say in the book that um, I really don't believe in the supernatural dimension and in anything like, for example, precognitive dreams or anything of this sort. But I think maybe in the unconscious you sometimes find out what you really do want. And when I was in my late teens early years in Oxford, I, I began to have this dream of being in the United States. I, I felt very drawn to it for reasons I couldn't quite understand. And at around the same time, I realised that I didn't want any other career path, all the reasons I'd gone to university. People said, well, you can become a lawyer, you can become a doctor. I, why would I be wanted to do that? What would it be? I want to be a writer. Don't want to be one, need to be one. And it, it's taken me until roughly the time of writing the memoir to find out that those two aspirations, sub or semi or unconscious ones, were the same. That in order to improve as a writer, I had to move to America and get out of the slightly warm bath, um, very agreeable, but still slightly warm bath uh, of 
of English life. An incidental question. Why yeah. do you think it 